All right, so welcome to this event of the East Asia Seminar Series from the Asian Institute at Monk School. I'm a journalist at the Toronto Star and chair of New Voices. We're an international nonprofit editorial platform, podcast, and social network with the mission of celebrating the creative and academic work of women in underrepresented communities on the subject of China. Our Canadian chapter director, Sola Rina Ho, who you will hear from as our Q&A moderator today, launched our chapter in Toronto last winter. And we had the privilege then of having East Asia Seminar Series Director, Diana Fu, as our first guest speaker. Thank you to the Asian Institute for partnering with us on this panel. So lately there's been a lot of attention on actions from Beijing in particular, such as alleged interference in Canadian elections. But we wanted to work together on this broader conversation on transnational repression. Transnational repression is a term that's becoming more commonly used by academics, NGOs, governments. Um, it kind of asks questions like how does foreign actions affect ordinary people on democratic soil? The assassination of Canadian Sikh activist Hardeep Niger last summer has pointed to potential complicity by India's government, for example. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panel, but first we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron, Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, it is still home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So our panelists today are Sanjay Ruparelia. He is an Associate Professor of Politics at Toronto Metropolitan University. His major publications include Divided We Govern, Coalition Politics in Modern India, The Indian Ideology and Understanding India's New Political Economy. Suzanne Scoggins is an Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of Asian Studies at Clark University. Her research focuses on policing and security in reform era China. Her first book, Policing China, Street Level Cops in the Shadow of Protest is out now. We have Sharnjeet Kaur Sandra, a historian, exhibit curator, storyteller, and founder of Belonging Matters Consulting. She is a passionate activist building bridges between community and academia through her museum and media work. And last but not least, we have Mira al a senior researcher at the Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at University of Toronto. Her work takes an in-depth look at human rights issues connected to disinformation, digital authoritarianism, and digital transnational repression. I will hand it over now to uh, Diana, our co-chair and moderator today, but first a few housekeeping items. If you would like to submit questions, look on the bottom of your screen. You can write out your questions at any time through the Zoom Q&A feature. And please note that this will be a recorded event. And if you would like to share it afterwards, you can find a recording on the Monk School's YouTube channel. You can also sign up to learn of future events on the Monk School Asian Institute website and follow us on New Voices on any social media platform or podcast uh, platform to keep in touch with our work as well. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Joanna. And I want to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon to talk about a very important and heavy topic, sobering topic of transnational repression. Um, so I want to dive right into this because we have a, a distinguished panel of um, really of a very interesting distribution of expertise. Um, so I want to start with um, with Syria. I mean, oftentimes when we think of transnational repression, we think of you know, the most authoritarian, the most autocratic states in the world carrying it out, and Syria would be one of them. So as an Islamic state, mired in civil war um, for over a decade, one of the most violent, corrupt, and poor nations in the Middle East. And it's also a regime that is known to carry out transnational oppression. So I wanted to direct our first question to our panelist, Nora. Nora, as, a, as an activist and also as a researcher at the Citizen Lab here at the University of Toronto, can you give us a bit of um, personal, a bit about your personal story with transnational repression? You've written about it, uh, you've gone public with it, um, and the context in which this is taking place. Um, is How common is transnational repression as a tactic for the Assad regime, and what, what have been some of the international responses to it? Over to you, Nora. Thank you so much, Diana, for the for having me and for this question. I truly appreciate the opportunity to share this insight and on transnational repression and uh, linking it to my personal experience as uh, an activist and also as a researcher. I grew up in a family that uh, 
Yeah, I remember that we had uh, an uncle. He was studying abroad, and uh, since then he couldn't come back. And my childhood memories were mostly around security forces visiting my grandmother, uh, repeatedly asking her uh, about him and how other family members, when they were applying for jobs, uh, always the question around him uh, erases and also uh, in some incidents it was cited because he was an activist in uh, in his exile. Uh, he was always cited as a reason for the decline of their job uh, or employment. Um, so through all of these memories, that's what shaped my uh, my childhood and also uh, my anticipation of the consequences and the very high price of activism. And uh, yeah, I remember when I crossed the borders uh, to from Syria to Turkey in 2013, when my sister, younger sister, told me like, it's okay, we will be back. I told her like, we will never be back. You don't know what does it mean and you don't know uh, what exile uh, and what's, what does it mean to be uh, an exiled activist. Uh, unlike being domestically acting, uh, you don't know exactly who and what are you fighting. So transnational repression in Syria is not a new practice, is a long-standing practice employed by the Syrian regime. I can say that in the modern history of Syria, it's, we can say that it's dated back to the inception of the modern authoritarian uh, regime under the Assad father back in the 70s who faced opposition movements advocating for democracy and rule of law. Uh, for sure, his response was marked by extreme violence, including massacres. Whole cities were vanished and families disappeared uh, from, uh, from the existence, uh, execution, mass murder, and so on. However, even those who managed to escape to exile were not safe as the regime retaliated with assassination, kidnapping, and infiltration of spies and agents into diaspora communities through various means, including recruitment, pro-regime diaspora groups and NGOs, and, and diplomatic missions, among many other tactics. This tragic pattern of transnational repression continues until today, as the Assad regime, the Assad son, Bashar al-Assad, resist in employing tactics such as surveillance, harassment, kidnapping, and assassination to suppress dissidents and target opposition figures abroad. Uh, the Syrian government reach extends beyond the borders, creating atmosphere of fear and intimidation within diaspora communities worldwide. Back in 2001, when Bashar al-Assad assumed presidency, a new form of authoritarian of authoritarianism emerged, empower, empowered by the information and communication technology revolution. This era of digital authoritarianism significantly expanded the regime's ability to repress both domestically and abroad. As the 2011 uprising, Syrian diaspora communities mobilized and advocated for democratic change in their host, in their host countries. That led to the emergence of new repression tactics that combine traditional offline and uh, other methods of digital surveillance uh, and digital technology. These range from, for instance, monitoring and surveilling their social media accounts to hacking or phishing disinformation campaigns, and even the use of more sophisticated tools like malware. For instance, like speaking about the malware, uh, Citizen Lab reported on uh, multiple incidents, and one of them was uh, the report uh, entitled Group Number Five. It was about me, actually, uh, when I was subjected to a like very complicated, sophisticated uh, attempt of hacking me uh, through malware and also like through me hacking people within uh, the activism uh, atmosphere by Iranian uh, actors or Iranian back actors back then. Uh, the geolocation of individuals didn't shield them from this uh, repression. Uh, incidents have been reporting in countries such as the United States, Canada, Canada, and other European states as well, besides the other uh, parts of the world, for sure. Uh, extraterritorial killing, kidnapping, 
uh, forced return and other forms of violence or threats were reported and all carried out to politically uh, like silence and the purpose of silencing the uh, the activists and deterring them from continuing their advocacy. The regime and regime affiliated groups and other allied states threatened and harassed witnesses during trials. Uh, I don't know if many of you heard uh, about some of the uh, ongoing trials against the regime in uh, different European nation, in different European countries. For instance, Koblenz trial. Uh, many of the witnesses or survivors who were potential witnesses were threatened in many different ways, including how, like, some of them reported how their families back home were visited uh, for a cup of tea or a cup of coffee by the regime, and they were threatened if they will go to the to the court to testify. Uh, it means that their family would face the uh, kidnapping or the arrest and so on. Uh, also, witnesses of the uh, or survivors of the chemical attacks, whether in Juma or Khan Shekhun, uh, were threatened. And just last week, we were talking about that and how this is really uh, like really uh, constituting a barrier to uh, seeking justice and accountability for the crimes of committing uh, chemical attacks. Oh, thank you. And thank you, Nora. I'm just going <laughs> to cut you off right there. Yeah. <clears throat> really, really important um, points. And this, and thank you for sharing your story with us. <clears throat> the um, note about going for tea and coffee is actually reminiscent of the China case as well, where uh, yeah. the, uh, the tea is actually not something you want to be invited to eh, by security agents. So let's now turn to um, turn to our India experts here, because, you know, as I said, we, we might think of transnational oppression as a authoritarian, autocratic state, violent states, but yet authoritarian states are not the only ones carrying out transnational oppression. And we've seen that firsthand with breaking news here in Canada with the assassination of the Sikh independence leader Hardeep Singh Najir on Canadian soil last June. And Najir has been... Um, has been long been on the Indian government's radar for promoting an independent Khalistan back in India, which would essentially carve out uh, a state on Indian soil, a separate state. Now, he is a Canadian citizen who immigrated in the mid-1990s, and Trudeau's government is accusing Modi's government of killing uh, killing this guy based on intelligence sources. So this is a very serious accusation, and it is one that Modi's government obviously flat out denies. But let's turn to our India specialists, both Sanjay and Sharanjit. Uh, can you situate this uh, for us in a broader context of Modi's governance? Is it plausible that under Modi, you, you'd see the world's largest democracy, which is now, you know, backsliding, uh, whatever you want to call it now, um, engage in assassinating opponents abroad? And what is the historical significance of this? And here I'm thinking specifically of Sharon Jeet's work, because you're a historian and an activist. What is the historical significance of the Sikh independence movement, starting with Indira Gandhi's assassination? So let's start with Sanjay for the context of, of this under Modi's governance, because you've been working on, uh, on that for a while especially comparing it to, to Xi Jinping's governance. Let's start with you and then turn it over to Sharon Jeet. Sure. Thanks, Diana. So uh, this is a very explosive allegation, uh, which many who are here today would know about. Um, Prime Minister Trudeau made an allegation that an agent of the government of India was involved in the uh, murder of Mr. Niger in June 2023. He made the allegation in September. The Indian government dismissed it as absurd and motivated and uh, Indo-Canadian ties went into a deep freeze. It was only then later when the Financial Times broke a story that uh, a similar plot had been foiled on US soil uh, with the leading advocate for Sikhs to justice, Sikhs for justice, uh, Mr. Panun, that, uh, that we learned that the intelligence had been shared uh, by the United States. There were rumors of that before, but, but that suddenly changed the situation. The Indian government responded quite differently and said they were going to cooperate and take this very seriously because the national security of both countries was at stake. So those are the sort of, in a nutshell, the events. Um, the main agency involved, and there's a number of security agencies in India, would be the Research and Analysis Wing, RAW. The closest uh, the closest to, um, and analogs would be the CIA and Mossad, with which 
uh, Raw has had actually very extensive ties since it was formed in the late 1960s. And mostly its activities would be um, focused on the subcontinent in Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan. But after 2008, uh, people who've studied this said that Raw began to expand more broadly. This was after the attacks on Mumbai. So I think it's important to see that context that Raw itself in a prior regime which was run by the Congress party, the prime minister at the time was Manmohan Singh, had already begun to expand its activities beyond the subcontinent because they felt real security threats uh, in the light of a series of terrorist attacks that happened in India through the 2000s. When Mr. Modi came to power in 2014, though, uh, he came to power very much as a strong man, as a leader. Um, and what we've seen in the last decade is a suppression of civil liberties um, a crackdown on lots of civil society organizations, a criminalization, uh, in many cases of dissent using sedition laws and other, other anti-terror reg legislation. Um, and there have been reports that the national security agencies and national security itself as, as both a discourse and as a priority have, have become more important in the last decade. Um, and so there is a sort of domestic dimension to this, that this is a more, um, certainly a more autocratic regime in the world's largest democracy. It's happened in many democracies, as we know, around the world. Uh, the ruling party advocates a form of ethno-nationalism. So uh, minorities of various kinds have also felt a great deal of pressure. Um, and so that's just some of the context. And I can talk more about it, to Sarenji, to talk a little bit about the, the Khalistan movement and, and other issues. Thanks so much, Sanjay. Um, I kind of want to pick off of the way Noura actually began by framing her lived um, experience. And I think that's really important because 1984 is a very important year for six across Canada. I'm sorry, my lighting is being funny right now. Um, and, and the framing of the question says, you know, what is the Khalistan movement from the assassination of Indira Gandhi? And I was going to suggest changing that, but I thought, why not make that as part of the conversation? Because that's actually part of the problem, right? The way we situate historically the moment uh, of like Sikh liberation movements or even Sikh genocide as being from Indira Gandhi's assassination onward is part of the problem because Sikhs um, faced state-based oppression in India from the 70s and 80s. And actually, you know, that, that um, uh, violence really took place in June of 1984 when our Takht and the Harmandar Sahib, which is the golden, colloquially known as the Golden Temple, was attacked, our archives were destroyed, people were murdered, Indira Gandhi was assassinated in October, and then there was four days of lockdown in the city of Delhi and other places based off of um, state-based um, genocide and targeted genocide against Sikhs. I say all this in a rush to highlight the fact that this is part of a continuum right, of, of uh, movements of liberation in the state of Punjab for the calling of Khalistan. Now it's complicated because Khalistan itself is complicated. The movement itself is, um, you know, stark with a lot of Sikhs who also disagree with the movement or agree with the movement or challenge the movement. And so there is no one answer to what Khalistan is, who it is for and, and what it means. But at the end of the day, by Hardeep Singh Nijjar was fighting for an independent state of Khalistan in Canada, right? He wasn't doing it through violence. He wasn't doing it in any illegal way. He was just voicing dissent against the Indian state. And because of that, he was assassinated. Um, uh, and as uh, Sanjay very rightly said, you know, the patterns in which it came out later that um, it was revealed that the Indian state had a role to play. Being in Sikh community spaces, I also want to highlight the fact that our community had been talking about this for years, right? Like from a community internal perspective, we were saying um, that this man is targeted and they weren't listened to, right? CSIS was apparently aware that this man was a target and they weren't listened to. And I think that's really important because what it means is that when we're talking about state-based um, repression, oppression, community organizations know this. Um, the system of surveillance taking place against Sikh or even like communities who dissent against India also happened during the farmers protest, right? Colleagues of mine had death threats sent against them. I was trolled on social media by those BJP IT cells back to again, Noura's comment around, you know, the, um, uh, what did you say? Sorry, the malware, right? Utilizing these softwares and um, social media to target and, and try to find where we live, our children, 
this is all part of the oppressive regime that is taking place. And again, I'll I'll cut it short there to add more context with more questions, but I think all of this is taking place. And also it's really interesting, CSIS itself was founded in 1984. So I think there's an interconnection to a lot of these conversations around why this year is so important and the assassination of Pai, um, Hardeep Singh Ji and what's taking place with India to this very moment. Thank you. And I want to circle back um, to all of the panelists about policy responses uh, and why it is that, you know, with so many uh, warnings ahead of time that we know who's going to be targeted, but nobody does anything, right? So let me then, let me first though, turn to um, our, our other panelist, um, Suzanne. Suzanne, you've written uh, a lot about um, the Chinese policing apparatus. You have a whole book on it, which is a fantastic book that you guys should definitely go out to read. She talks about how China's police are very unhappy. And we know that the Chinese government in, under Xi Jinping has actually stepped up its coercion of dissidents, much like Modi has. It's gone after dissidents, it's gone after corrupt officials, it's gone after ethnic minorities within and outside of its borders. It's also taken this campaign to a global level. And again, here in Canada, we have been impacted uh, with conservative MP Michael Chong, who, who have been advocating for uh, stronger policies against trans transnational oppression or who have been advocating for who, who has been active advocating for that because he was targeted by the Chinese government in retaliation for his advocacy around Xinjiang, which is the Muslim region and Muslim people in China. Um, and in the U.S., there's also been increased attention to overseas um, police stations that have been set up by China without the permission of local authorities. So Suzanne, tell us a little bit about um, your study of the Chinese policing apparatus and what you know or what you suspect these overseas police stations are doing. Thank you, Diana. Yeah, these the it's really interesting because we've seen under Xi Jinping the Chinese police become much more international, much more transnational than they had been in years past. Although this this has been growing through uh, training exercises and uh, of course um, the the you know sending people abroad, like trying to to gather information about people who had fled abroad, criminals that had fled abroad. Um, but it, it sort of reached a fever pitch uh, in, in 2022 when uh, this small NGO that I, I think um, you know, works on all of these issues, but maybe was not very well known and is now extremely well known called Safeguard Defenders, released this report that said there were, you know, a, the number was 54 in the original uh, report, 54 overseas Chinese police stations operating. Uh, they did a follow-up report bringing that number up to 102 in 53 countries, including the United States. Um, and uh, it just set off a, a wave of concern about what these stations were doing and, and, and whether or not they were repressing individuals. We are, this is a, a sort of ongoing process of collecting information, but as um, more details come out, it does appear that there were instances of, of repression coming out that were started in these these police stations. And so in April of last year, uh, the FBI actually charged two individuals uh, in, in New York City with operating this um, overseas Chinese police station that obstructed uh, the investigation. They destroyed evidence. This is all in the official record. Um, and they uh, tried to participate, in, or they did participate in a uh, counter protest um, and uh, we're gathering information about a, uh, a, a dissident who lived in California ostensibly to uh, to engage in some sort of repression. And so this this um, provides fuel to those fears that that, that some of these uh, overseas police stations and again they they haven't all been completely confirmed. This is coming from uh, uh, really good information uh, that was posted by the police themselves. Um, in, in China about where these stations were that, that safeguard defenders brought together. Um, but not every station that they identify has been confirmed on foreign soil because it's just there's there's so many of them. Um, and it leads to it leads to a, a lot of questions about those activities and, and the US case provides some insight into to, to instances of repression. Members of the Falun Gong have also said they've been contacted. Um, there's a, a dissident in the Netherlands who was contacted. Um, and and what's interesting is that the Chinese government has been 
I, I guess relatively um, first first they denied that that you know these things uh, these stations were uh, actually police stations and then they said um, they were stations but they were just to provide services like driver's licenses no no repression um, just just you know services to Chinese people who couldn't go back home during COVID um, and now they've said they've closed all the stations. But I think the the larger issue is is how do people experience this? And so there was an interesting um, in the uh, Netherlands there was a a survey of uh, of uh, members of the Chinese uh, diaspora, and, and uh, the only thing that they agreed on in the survey this was run by um, Frank Pickett in in the in the University of uh, Leiden. Um, uh, and they uh, they said that everyone, almost all of their respondents, reported that these stations uh, were designed for intimidation. And so there there are there's the act of actual repression, and then there's the the psychological effect of having Chinese police stations operating locally, um, but that that is in addition to to the actual activities. Uh, but we we really are just uh, still learning about what what acts of repression did occur. And, and so we're gonna be watching, uh, the New York station was not the only station um, that was reported. There are also uh, others in the United States and, and, and one in particular, in particular in Los Angeles. And I think as more details of these, uh, these cases come out and as more cases potentially are lodged, we're, we're gonna learn more about the activities um, and, and how deep it actually runs. And just a quick follow up for you, Suzanne, based on your own knowledge and um, embedded research in, with the police in China, how likely do you think that these stations are, um, you know, for the most part doing service oriented thing? Uh, what I mean service, I just mean like processing renewals of driver's license or whatever they say, because the Chinese government says they're service stations, right? They're not police stations, they're servicing the diaspora. Um, and so based on your knowledge of, um, you know, how police stations work and what they do in China, um, how likely do you think that that's the case? So I, it's a really important question, right? And and um, I, I think the answer is that it's dual use, right? I, I definitely believe that they are renewing driver's licenses. I also uh, suspect that um, they may be contacting dissidents and there are a couple of campaigns that the Chinese government has launched to um, to uh, repatriate economic fugitives, people who've been accused of, of crimes, um, mostly related to corruption, but not always. Uh, Fox uh, Fox Hunt and Skynet, the two operations. Um, there is uh, there's evidence to suggest that that these stations were you know, at least in place in a position where they could help facilitate uh, those activities. And there's a lot of interest uh, in, as as China fights corruption domestically at home, there's a lot of interest in getting individuals who have fled the country back to China um, through the means necessary. Right. The per I think they're called persuasion to return. Uh, campaigns. Now, before I get to, I know there was a couple of um, questions that were sent in ahead of time. I think we still have, um, we have a half an hour. So I want to address one more question to all the panelists, which has to do with what I alluded to earlier, which is policy responses. We know transnational oppression is a problem. We know it's not a problem that's restricted to a regime type. We know that China and Syria aren't the only ones doing it. We know that communities, um, leaders, have notified you know various security national security people of various countries in Canada and the US about this is going to happen this person might be threatened this person's life might be threatened and then they didn't do anything about it so why this kind of policy um why why well, not even policy but why why this lack of response um first of all and then what can be done about it so let me turn back to Nora first this is really hard uh, and very completely complicated question. I believe, that, as some, someone who who's skeptical, and I don't address anything until it's officially written and acknowledged, uh, it's the lack of understanding. So far, we don't have uh, the governments, as we are observing, that they are still in confusion whether it's like what to call it is it foreign interference or transnational repression what does transnational repression mean and all of these i believe starting from there is very important to clarify things 
And as many people may be still confused about uh, where the line we can, where we can draw the line between transnational repression and foreign interference, and what's the difference between both of them, we can maybe based on the research and also with uh, speaking to policymakers and also to victims from many different communities who were targeted uh, in different liberal democracies that they feel when it comes to foreign interference. Uh, this is how we maybe can agree or work together to clarify this. Foreign interference classically is about state uh, engaging in the affairs of another state. However, when it comes to transnational repression, foreign interference may be like very broad to capture transnational repression under it, but it's not the case. Uh, transnational repression is the targeting against individuals who are being targeted based on the activities they are doing, based on their own identities, whether like um, ethnic minorities or they have been activists or they are conducting any kind of peaceful activism against the uh, affairs of that state that's targeting them on the soil of another state. So it's about the individuals. It's about the individual's rights. And sadly, speaking about human rights and all of those discussions around human rights in many countries are being overlooked. So targeting the human rights, targeting the human rights charter of the country that we live on, that the country assume or always celebrate the identity of being liberal, of being defending human rights globally. Uh, it's the, I think this is the core of the discussion should be. When the individuals are being targeted, is the state entitled to select when to intervene and when to protect? In the case of uh, of Sikh activists, when like they and also like so the activists uh, and other activists who are from countries of origin considered as allied of Canada, is Canada entitled to select when to intervene, when to protect, when to prevent the attack from happening? No, because the state is responsible of protecting ind individuals on its soil. So it's not something selective. Here we should really ask the questions about every single time that CSIS showed up to someone, warned them about uh, being targeted, and then nothing happened. And we know that CSIS is not, a, is not an enforcement agency. So where are the reports go? And who's responsible of all of those life laws? And then the other question is, when someone reported to uh, the... Uh, the to any institution in the government, how the government should handle this. So far, we don't have a mechanism to that. And uh, in our report at Citizen Lab that we published a couple of years ago, we interviewed around 19 individuals. None of them had satisfying response from any agency, including their MPs. Most of the time, the case would be whether overlooked or they it would be like in, engaging some kind of, including some kind of sexism, uh, when the target is a woman and dissidents, and it's like felt they have to handle their own security on their own. It's their own affair to do, uh, which is another case and other issue to be discussed. And I believe it's not fair at all to say that, uh, yeah, we can easily capture transnational repression and all of those crimes on the Canadian territory under transnational under foreign interference. Sorry. So yeah, I will leave it to other panelists because I'm really curious to uh, to know uh, and to learn from from them. Yeah, and I'm also glad that you brought up the gender dimension. That's not something that we've talked about, but it seems to be. And there's, I'm not aware of any database on this, but it seems to be from um, just the cases that we know of that women are more likely to be targets of transnational repression, and so that kind of that may play a part into the lack of response, lack of taking people seriously because you're a woman probably an immigrant. Uh, you probably don't have high, high status uh, in in, in um, the host country. So let's now turn to Sanjay, followed by Sharanjeet. Thanks. Um, so just just um, listening to Noor, I think on the question of transnational repression, I mean, particularly in the case of, I mean, there's a wide range of actions or activities that take place, right? From harassment to intimidation to, to threats of violence and then carrying them out. So I think when you ask like what would the response be, I think it really does depend on, in a sense, what it is we're talking about. So when it comes to harassment and intimidation, this could be for writers, journalists, students, scholars. Um, 
many of us here and of course who may be watching now may have experienced some of these things so i think that's where i think just disclosure and talking about uh these activities is important that's difficult um one of the questions you'd asked us preparing for this was you know are members of diaspora communities particularly vulnerable and i think they are and we can talk about that maybe a little bit more uh after this question but so I think one thing is just transparency around around the fact that this phenomenon is growing and happening, and the more people know about it and discuss it, and it's out in the open. Um, I think that itself is really important. When it comes to uh, Nora saying, why is it that, for instance, CSIS doesn't act or hasn't acted in some cases? I think there's at least two issues. One is their own rules about what are they allowed to disclose to people who they think are targets. Uh, of repression of any kind or people who might face threats. And I've read quite a bit of commentary, certainly in our own media, to say that there's a discussion amongst national security experts about whether they should disclose that uh, to targets or not. Right? In the case of uh, uh, Mr. Chong, the MP, that wasn't disclosed to him until quite a bit later that that he was under surveillance, but, but by whom and for what, it wasn't clear. I think the other issue that comes through, and it came through with the two different cases in the US and Canada, was is the intelligence that the agencies here have actionable? Are they able to intervene in time? So you could take preventive measures. If you think there's a real threat to somebody, you could provide protective measures, security beforehand. Um, but in the case, certainly comparing Canada and the US, what was sh seems to have been striking is the US was able to foil the plot. Was that because they had more powers to do so? Was that because their intelligence was better? Was that because they, they you know, they caught at least from the evidence we've seen from the FBI's unsealed indictment, uh, the the actual operation unfolding, and they have they have evidence of that. Uh, what is considered to be more credible evidence in court of law uh, versus what the Canadian agency had? Um, we're not sure. So I think this is just some of the issues that that come into play. And the final thing I'll just mention, but I'll just mention it and let others maybe address it if they'd like, is there's been a big debate around whether we should create a foreign registry. And there's and there's been there's been a debate on both sides of that question, that it would be a good thing and necessary to follow Australia and the United States in creating one. But others also raise concerns about it, about how it might be implemented uh, and what kind of blowback it might have on diaspora communities. Um, so I'll just mention that. Yeah, that's a really important discussion, um, an ongoing one. But uh, let's turn to Sharonjeet. Yeah, I'll keep my answer kind of short. I understood the question as being, um, you know, how or why aren't policies enacted here to be able to take action when we know that there is a um, a threat? And um, I think there's a couple of reasons. So one is systemic racism and specifically to the context of like the Sikh experience, definitely um, the word Khalistan in particular has a lot of reverberation, negative rever reverberations because it's also been fed to be something um, equitable or equal to, sorry, uh, the word terrorist, right? And that needs to be an unpacked at so many levels, including media here in Canada. So because of that systemic racism and because of the 1984-85 rhetoric, which includes the Air India bombing, right? Like it's this whole complicated history that Canada has in relationship to Khalistan. Khalistan is immediately seen or anybody connected to the word Khalistan is immediately seen as a deficit and a negative, as opposed to really understanding people that even I know who advocate for Khalistan for this idea of liberation and independent state and, and a different you know, approach to it. So because of that systemic racism, I think there is trepidation and fear institutionally across Canada to actually address the issue and enact upon it when we know there are threats against people here in Canada, Canadian citizens um, by the Indian state. The other reason I think is it's because the balancing act that Canada is trying to um, maintain with India as an economic power, right? In British Columbia, where I live in particular, there's constantly ongoing conversations and negotiations with economics, which I know nothing about. Like, I don't understand the intricacies of it, but I can see that being kind of a, this balancing act of we want to challenge this um, uh, threat, but we also want to maintain those ties. So how do we do that? So I think that's that struggle that's currently taking place. Thanks. And lastly, um, Suzanne, there has been uh, responses, right, um, to these overseas police stations all over the place calling for them to close. But um, can you talk a little bit about that? And and, and then also about um, 
uh, uh, responses to um, preventing uh, transnational oppression. Although in the China case, it doesn't seem to be a lot of assassinations. Yeah, I, we still have those geopolitical tensions, though, and and I think it's really interesting to to watch how different countries have responded based on uh, their relationship with China, and so the United States uh, appears to have been the most aggressive in terms of filing a lawsuit and actually charging individuals uh, in this case, but they are they are the only one. Um, other nations, uh, particularly the European nations, have, have issued strong statements, they've issued investigations, they've announced investigations, they've sent law enforcement out, um, and, and but you don't see it on the level of, uh, okay, we're going to charge individuals criminally for, for these activities, which is it, it's very interesting. And I think that it it's it's tapping into those U.S. China tensions, right? That it's it's sort of feeding off of um, already a strained relationship and and um, a uh, a an ability, of, as uh, Sanjay pointed out, to collect the evidence, right? Because you have to there there is a burden here of collecting evidence um, that that can be actionable. I think one of the other issues that's that's probably masking a lot of, or, or some of the repression is, is just people's uh, unwillingness to report this to local authorities. So if you are um, being harassed by uh, a foreign government, um, you may not be reaching out to local law enforcement. And if you're reaching out to your local police, they're not gonna be able to help you in the same way that a national police force like the FBI is going to, they're just not gonna treat it in the same way. And they may not be referring that case um, up if they are, are not knowledgeable about it. So there, there are a, a lot of things coming into play that, um, that, that may be obscuring uh, repression and our understanding of it. Thank you. Uh, so Lorena, I'm gonna hand it over to you for Q&A from the audience. Great, thank you, Diana. Um, so we have quite a few questions that have come in. So um, we probably won't be able to get through all of them, but we'll try to hit um, you know, as many as we can and, and some of the key ones. Um, so someone, one of our listeners have asked um, if we can consider American extraordinary rendition and targeted killing programs in the war on terror as forms of transnational repression. And to what extent can recent campaigns of transnational repression by other countries like India be traced to the U.S. example as a role model? Uh, more broadly, is there a boundary between, quote, legitimate black ops espionage operations and, quote, illegitimate transnational repression? Or is it degree of who gets securitized as threats. Uh, so Sanjay, did you want to uh, take a stab at that? Sure. I, I'm really glad um, that question was asked. I think it's really important to have that wider context. Um, the discussion we're having today is focused on, on states like India and China, what's happening in Canada. And it's really important that we address these threats that have, that have emerged. But, uh, you know, as the questioner says, that this is a, that other democratic states are involved in all kinds of um, foreign interference and, and repressive activities, not least through targeted killings. Um, and there's a very well, document, de very well documented history, sorry, about the U.S. being involved in this from rendition, for instance, drone strikes under the Obama administration, in which the concept of an imminent continuing threat was expanded uh, vastly. So hundreds of people have died through drone strikes yeah. uh, in Afghanistan and in other parts where U.S. has car carried out counterinsurgency operations. Israel is really well known, um, you know, into the hundreds and sometimes thousands of targeted killings over the last two decades. And so I think this is really important. I think in in Canada in particular, I feel compared to the U.S. and in, in Britain, I, I would go on a limb and say this. I think our discourse um, does not our, our public discourse does not really focus on this that our own allies like the united states the most important countries that we have long-standing ties with like israel they also carry out these kinds of operations and for people who have studied this some scholars that i was just looking at this week actually it was in the wake of the obama administration's changed legal status on the question of imminence what is an imminent threat and its expansion of that uh, notion, the concept that we began to see actually China and India uh, begin to also borrow some of that language legally when they were justifying their own actions. Um, in interestingly, not all states, Brazil, for instance, didn't follow through, but other states did. So I think uh, certainly autocratic states pose, you would say in general, or you would assume greater threat. But democratic states can behave in all kinds of autocratic ways. And clandestine activity and covert ops, by definition, are 
are in the shadows. And we only tend to find out they've happened when something goes wrong, like in the case of the foiled assassination plot on U.S. soil. So I think that's really important to keep in mind uh, and not to whitewash what is happening uh, in the West and by Western states historically during the Cold War and since. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Maria, uh, one of the students taking uh, Diana's course on uh, Chinese uh, politics um, beyond the headlines. Um, so her question is um, for Sharanjit. Uh, as an activist, how can communities and individuals effectively respond to transnational repression and what role can activism play in addressing these challenges? Ooh, love that question, Maria. I love questions about activism. Um, <laughs> I think activism is, first of all, on a huge spectrum, right? So when we think of activism, I think a lot of people think like protesting on the streets. And I always tell people, you know, you're on this spectrum. So if you have a privileged position to be an instructor at a university or to be an academic or to be a museum creator like I am, like that's privilege to be able to tell the stories and speak the things you want to speak out loud in, in a way that makes systems and institutions uncomfortable. And so, you know, first it's important that we find that spectrum that we choose to be in and to be activists in. And even reclaiming the word activism is a huge, um, it's an important thing to be doing now, especially when like language around like woke is being co-opted in a very negative and incorrect way, right? So um, my answer to that is that communities are already doing it, right? Communities are doing it. It's just that they don't get the limelight. So again, if I look at British Columbia and like organizations like the Poetic Justice Foundation and all the activist communities here um, protesting daily at the Vancouver Art Gallery, you know, uh, for Palestine, for example, these are academics and scholars and, and cultural professionals who are doing this work, who are engaging in the conversations. It's just that they don't get the public sphere kind of recognition. Um, so it's really important that we acknowledge it. The other thing is I wrote a note, so I saw this question earlier. Remembering is really important. Um, remembering and rewriting our own histories is really, really important, right? Like when we, we are talking about stories of transnational repression that are connected to our personal identities, it's so important we reclaim the language that is being um, perhaps altered, like the way I just tried to describe Khalistan, for example, it's so important that the positions that we have, we provide a full 360 degree view of it so that it's not fed through a lens that is white supremacist. And I think that's a really important action and activism to take place so that we be the shapers of our own stories and histories. So I think that's a really important way for like social scientists and historians, for sure. Great, thank you. And um... A question from uh, Kimberly Lenz. Um, she wanted to know if uh, the panel can explain more about the advantages and disadvantages of a foreign registry. Um, Suzanne, did you want to take a stab at that? <laughs> um, Nora? Sadly, I didn't do any research on this. Okay, but no worries. I can jump into other questions. Okay. Um, I guess uh, another question. Um, I has naming Sanjay? Sorry, I knew the answer to that question because Sanjay, oh. you mentioned the no. I didn't want to put you on the spot, but I thought you mentioned foreign registry, and I kind of want to know the answer to that question. I, I definitely don't know the answer to the question. I think I think there have been you know the the argument for it. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward that if if there are people uh, in any country in Canada, for instance, who are working on behalf of a foreign government or foreign agent, uh, but in a way that's covert, that's not open. They're not. They're not openly. Uh, they're not employees of that state or officials of that state. Um, in a sense, they've been paid in some way in some kind. That that should be clear. One, so that people know that this person is speaking on behalf of a foreign state and not in their own personal capacity. Uh, and so, in that sense, the arguments for it have been. Pretty, pretty straightforward. The arguments against um, that I've heard and read uh, in Canada itself would be that it might cast, there's there's a growing fear about just casting aspersions on a community as a whole, right? And so we're creating a foreign registry. Um, who, 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 in a sense, what, what are the provisions of that registry? What countries would be targeted? Now, is it the case that it would be China and Iran and Russia, for instance? And does that cast some kind of a shadow? And now India, some might say, would that cast a shadow on people 
saying things that might be construed as supporting another state's point of view and then you you're sort of tarred with that right i'm mean, gonna give a very concrete example there may be positions that india takes on a whole series of international issues that i actually agree with independently um what does a foreign registry do for someone like me or somebody else are you seen is there kind of a, a cast is a suspicion cast upon that person or has it been removed and i've seen both that argument on both sides of a foreign registry so it does get a question of freedom of expression, of, of a sense of presumption of innocence of individuals or communities as a whole. Um, but there seems to be a lot of arguments at the moment for it. And the government so far has not responded to it. But there's, I mean, you can see it in the you know many media outlets and, and certainly the opposition in Canada. And, and many experts who work on national security have been advocating for it. But, but we still haven't seen it yet. I mean, these are some of the arguments. I'm sure there are others as well. Right. And kind of along the same lines, um, we had an, another question um, from uh, Brandon Curtis. In the view of this panel, have there been any specific policy responses to trans transnational repression that have stood out to you as promising or conversely that have been, have there been responses that you feel are very counterproductive to addressing the issue and um, therefore should be avoided? Uh, Nora, would you like to respond to this one? Maybe I can quickly address some good practices that uh, some European countries have in place, but surely uh, they are subjected to criticism and uh, uh, they need a lot of uh, development. Um, uh, for instance, some of the European countries, maybe I can't name them, uh, they do have the program for uh, safe housing. So for instance, when an activist and or dissident on their soil would report to the police uh, being subjected or feeling that they are under threat or otherwise they were warned by the police that they are uh, there are some information that this person is under sort of threat by a agent uh, of a foreign state immediately they would be offered the option to go to a safe housing which is great because in many cases that we we interviewed for instance in canada uh, people felt that their own safety is on is their own business, and when they ask the police to offer such uh, such forms of safety, they were denied this. Uh, and they said, "Yeah, you can maybe." I, I remember, like an activist from Baluchistan, uh, he was told by the police, "Yeah, you can hire a bodyguard." They're like, how? How I can afford it? Uh, so yeah, this this is one of the good practices. Other practices maybe. Uh, is the uh, how uh, victims are being empowered to seek justice and accountability. So uh, the uh, some of the Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries like Sweden, Denmark, and Netherlands, they come together to uh, hold some of the diplomats, Iranian diplomats involved in the assassination attempts of Iranian activists or like activists from uh, uh, who are against acting against uh, the, uh, the interest of Iran uh, in, into account, and they broke uh, the UN Convention. So in Canada, we have the state impunity in place, and there's no discussion yet about how uh, Canada can empower dissidents on its soil to seek justice and accountability. So we can have a rule of law, we can say that there is some some kind of justice is being in place. I can think about other practice that uh, the United States uh, a year ago, I think, established, which is the hotline. So if there's anyone uh, feel like they are being subjected to any sort of online or offline harassment, they can report directly through this uh, hotline to, uh, to the FBI. Uh, I don't know a lot about uh, how people, to what extent they feel like they're Feel comfortable reporting or how are those uh, responses from the FBI but at least we have a system in place uh, in many cases that uh, we interviewed uh, people who were complaining about they don't know exactly uh, whose mandate is this is it the mandate of the local police is it the mandate of the RCMP is it the mandate of uh, XYZ of the agencies so having a like dedicated agency in place is something uh, wonderful is something that would solve a lot of problem and that this agency the best case scenario this, this is the dream would play the role of facilitating the responses across all other agencies based on their own mandates 
Great. Um, I think we might have time for one more uh, question with a quick answer. Um, although I know none of these answers are uh, realistically um, that quick. Um, last one uh, from Zhen Zhen Liang. Um, how could can Canadian Indian relationships be repaired under the context of Western cooperation in balancing China's rise? No one wants to take a stab at this one. <laughs> I was waiting for Shanji if she wanted to ask. Could take no. Well, I think I think both governments. Uh, well, right now we're still waiting to see what the RCMP investigation uh, in the case of Mr. Nijo's killing proceeds. Right, it's it's not as advanced as the FBI's unsealed indictment that's still working its way through a district court. Uh, it's certainly the case at the government level that there's an attempt to repair these relations. There's a resumption of visa services uh that had been cancelled in in october uh the foreign minister uh mr lee had talked about pragmatic diplomacy but protecting canadian sovereignty and i think in a sense those are the principles officially that make sense going forward that canada has to get to the bottom of what happened and if someone is responsible they have to be held to account at the same time that they want to stabilize the relationship because there is so much at stake uh in the relationship between India and Canada. I mean, not simply questions of trade and commerce, uh, which, you know, in both countries' cases, particularly India is not as important, to be honest, but just simply the people-to-people -people ties. As Sharanji is mentioning, you know, the, the Indian diaspora uh, has been here for over a century. Um, it's the fastest-growing segment of new immigrants to Canada. Um, it's the majority of foreign stu international students now. Um, in almost every sector of Canadian life, the Indian diaspora has a massive uh, and growing uh, significance. And it's really important um, to make sure that these wider relations are not threatened and jeopardized by by some of these other things that have happened at the same time that, you know, the police and investigative agencies have to get to the bottom of it. I think, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty short, direct answer. But I think, I think that's what we're beginning to see at the official level. Right. Uh, thank you so much, um, and thank you to uh, to Diana for guiding us through a very thoughtful hour, but very fast hour of discussion. Um, I know this is a massive topic, but we covered quite a lot, um, you know, from how personal transnational repression is um, with some of the personal stories that you shared and just how our states are willing to go both in terms of, you know, everything from threats to family to more extreme acts of violence. Um, and how obviously this is not exclusively, you know, an authoritarian regime, um, you know, scenario. Um, and also just discussing the the nuances and different perspectives on foreign interference versus transnational repression. But we're running out of time, unfortunately. So I wanted to just uh, give a quick, um, some concluding thoughts. Um, Today's events is co-hosted again by the Asian Institute's East Asian Seminar Series and New Voices. I wanted to give a shout out to Arba Bardi who worked hard behind the scenes to help us put the seminar together. And if you'd like to attend future events like today's or on broader topics, visit the events page for the Hmong School of Global Affairs at the, uh, at the University of Toronto. Um, as you've heard from Joanna, on New Voices, we're a global collective bringing together a diverse group of veteran and emerging writers, journalists, translators, and artists, and more. And we want to put a spotlight on the amazing work being done by marginalized and underrepresented voices whose work focuses on China and the broader Sinosphere and celebrating what they do and supporting what they do and connecting them to journalists and other spaces who are looking for experts. Um, we're entirely volunteer based um, and original content like our podcasts and online magazines would not be possible without the support of our donors. So if you'd like to support our work, visit us at www.newvoices.com and we welcome, you know, one time or monthly contributions. Um, as mentioned, our Toronto chapter is still relatively new, but given the diaspora communities across Canada and our strong academic and creative environment of expertise, um, we hope we can do more to not only amplify the voices from China, but serve as a bridge to connect those with a shared passion and interest on, you know, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and the wider Mandarin speaking communities. So visit us um, and find all the ways you can connect. 
Once again, thank you to our amazing guest panelists, uh, Sanjay Ruparelia, Shanjit Korsandra, Suzanne Scoggins, and Noura Aljazawi, who took the time out of your very busy schedules to share your expert insights on this critical issue. And of course, to my co-host, Diana Fu and Joanna Chu. And importantly, thank you to all of you who joined us online. And that concludes today's event.